All right, so today's guest is my buddy Tom Bailey. He is owner of Sick Week, Sick the Mag, Drag and Drive Legend, uh, Sick Pizza, right? Is that what it's called? Yeah, sick sick pizza. pizza. That's actually one of the coolest things I, I feel because, like, I don't know, pizza places from New York, pizza's just like, it's kind of like a religion almost. Yep. <laughs> so we're going to sit down and talk to him about some Drag and Drive stuff. We, their Drag and Drive events have just exploded like I've never seen. And... Why do you think it took 10 years? Like, I feel like 10 years ago is when Drag Week started, and now they're Yeah, Drag Week's actually the- like 2005. So, I mean, you're talking 2005 or 2006 was the first Drag Week. So, I mean, you're talking 15, 16 years. So, like... It took so long, and now it's like all of it. Now everybody's everywhere is building a car for it. Yeah, it's what- weird. Like, yeah, I don't... Don't even know. It's kind of weird because, like, this magazine came out like a year and a half ago, dedicated to it, and then all of a sudden it exploded. So, I wonder yeah. if there's any coincidence there. Because there's ones so. in like North Carolina, <laughs> there's ones in, you're even doing one in Death Valley, which. Correct. Yep. <laughs> so, that'll be a good one. And, and then it's cool. Like, I think it, I think really it just goes back to, I mean, it goes back to call it the grassroots of racing i mean like you read the stories obviously we weren't around for the model t's and Mm -hmm. model a's and all that crap but i mean it was people modifying their street car they didn't have dedicated cars that they took to the track and uh um and you look at the price of racing i mean we we know how expensive it is to race and like to to have dedicated cars that just race and then they spend all the rest of the time just sitting in the garage not getting used i mean that's yeah that's our part that's what got me into when i was 2010 11 when i was getting going to get back into racing obviously had kids like you have all those expenses that you really can't do Mm -hmm. a lot of your own fun stuff and then i was getting back in it's like i read an article about driving and i'm like oh well this is perfect because now i can literally go get a year's worth of racing in in a week but the others now i can use my car like i can take it to dinner i can take it Mm -hmm. i can drive it to work like all of those things and i think that in 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 like you said why is it taking so long for it to like explode i don't know but it's like it's it's almost like the switch just went off for a lot of people they're like wait a second i can use my car for more than just the track yeah like because i think i saw Freiburger talking about it he was like i've been doing this forever like all of a sudden now like obviously i want to see more and more of them because i think we need more of them apparently because everyone is selling out in a minute and a half right so we can't it's not like there's an oversaturated market if you obviously have businesses. If there's that many people trying to go to your business, right. you just open one next door. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, what is that What is that saturation point? I mean, obviously this year we'll probably find out because, I mean, there's so many events going on this year. And I think some will, I think some will become annual events and I think some of them may, may fade quickly. I mean, mm-hmm. but maybe, maybe all of them become annual events. Like, don't know. I mean, that's, that's always the big beef is like, well, I really want to get into Rocky Mountain and I can never get in. And like, I mean, and same thing with Drag Week or anything else. It's like, well, I don't know, this year, like you should be able to get in somewhere. I mean, I think yeah. that there's enough stuff going on that like literally there's something for everybody. And that's the nice thing too, is there's like regional now where, you know, there's the one in Florida, then all the way in Rocky Mountain Race Week. Cause for people that may not realize that's like a 30 hour drive from us. Like yep. that's on the other side of the country. <laughs> that is a distance because some of the foreign viewers I realize don't understand the vast distance it takes to get to some of these other racing venues and stuff like that but so who has the record right now do you have the record for Dragon Drive like which record I guess overall ever overall so yeah how do you consider that so do you consider average do you consider it one in like a Hail Mary pass what what do you what do you think yeah, about I don't when know. you think I mean, of I think records? It's, to me, I think important? it's yeah. I think it's just it's an annual thing that like how did stuff shake out or whatever last year with stuff. I think that the the average, I I think the average is like six nineteen or whatever for the week, and that's Lutz had that in sixteen, I think. Mm-hmm. So, um, and then I mean with two point oh, I mean that's the only car that's done a five second pass or whatever, like added drag and drive. So I mean that was a five ninety nine, but um. But I think that they're cool and like people want to publicize or whatever about the records. But I mean, I really, it's all, I mean, to me, it's all about personal goals and like, 
yeah. what you're doing because like it's it's this isn't call it pro mod racing or something like we don't all have like equivalent cars like they're not all built the same weight the same everything like to go class racing with i mean they're each built to a person's personality like someone may choose that they want a four thousand pound car because of the creature comforts they want in the car well is it right to say well that car's not as fast as this 2800 pound car like i mean that's generally not fair like yeah. i mean and that's where it comes down to that personal part of it i mean obviously there's the the ego always jumps in that everybody wants to win and you want to win your class or win the overall and uh that's all well and good but i think that i think that people are finding out about the um the adventure side of it and that's the part that's cool like literally like old school it's you it's you your co-pilot and your car for a week and like luck i mean at the track like that's always the big thing like at the track if we're just track racing then we break our car like what do we do we push it in the trailer mm -hmm. we leave it probably in the trailer for a week before we unload it and then try and figure out what's wrong with it we wait till we're mad, not mad at it and all the other stuff that goes on yeah and then we work on getting it ready to go to the next race well that's where the drag and drive stuff it's like no you got to figure out how to make that thing run to go drive 300 miles the next so, race is kind of right now like, right you got to get back on the road like now now it's not like oh you can figure it out in a few hours especially for some of the back-to-back -back days yep like you got now or never i i know after last year's sick week i absolutely hated my car i didn't want to sit in it i don't want to look at it anymore i was like i just spent enough time in it like i worked on it i was underneath it i was like i hate it i just put push it off to the side for now yep no and it's all and it's all stuff that you were messing with that normally you'd mess with over weeks like instead you're messing yeah. with it over hours to try and figure it out so that you can keep moving on it's like, like a hyper accelerant of your whole racing year into yep. one weekend and i guess that also brings into the record issue is some events are two three race tracks some events are five race tracks so you know if you have an overall record at a three race track event it's very different than an overall record at a drag week where you went to five venues. Yeah, and I think that I think that as far as anything goes, at least in in my mind or whatever, is like yeah, the four track five day deal. I mean, that's like the that's the standard to say that's mm -hmm. what it did. Now, does that am I taking anything away from a two or three day event? No, because those are all cool too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like and and the good thing about those two three day events is like as we see some of that stuff to, to crop up with like, I mean, both eighth mile events and like weekend events is like, it's going to be a easier for a lot more people to experience it because they might not, they might not have the ability to take these weeks off work to go race or go yeah. hang out or whatever. But you know what? They could do a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So like when you do one of those events and, and that's where I think a lot of those are like, um, not to, not to use like the word feeder event, but like those are things that can get you used to something and then I think that I think you do like one of those weekend events, you probably come out one more and saying, oh, OK, now I want to do one of the week long, like yeah. 800, 900 mile, thousand mile events. And um, I definitely like that idea as like a feeder event because you kind of have to get your feet wet a little bit in like a small. Maybe you go to a couple little eighth mile tracks, like nothing too crazy before you really get into something big like a Rocky Mountain race week is I, I consider it a lot more extreme because the mountains. Yep. The mountains change everything. Like Florida, you know, it's flat. You're you're not going to you're driving through the swamps of Florida. It's it's yep. not terrible. It may be hot. Last year was pretty cold one of the days, but yeah, a couple of the days. But that's where yeah, no, and like Rocky Mountain, it's like I always tell everybody like that is a that's a bucket list one that you need to do at once. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't necessarily recommend doing it a bunch of times because <laughs> it is hell. Like I mean, literally yeah. those mountains and everything, the most beautiful scenery you can ever have. Like I mean, it's just it's amazing, but like, I would not, <clears throat> I wouldn't do it in 2.0. Like, I mean, that's just, there's too much there. I mean, we did it in Aiden's, um, in Aiden Shipbox or whatever. And like, literally that car, like twin turbo LS deal, like as reliable as it gets, never mm -hmm. had to do anything. I mean, we wore out the tires on that event because whatever, raced and drove on the same tires. They were when we went there, but other than that, no issues whatsoever, but still kicked my ass. And literally that was there was nothing we had to do other yeah. than just show up. He goes down and the track drive. and now we drive to the next track. And yeah. I mean, still extreme. So, and even like with that, I did it one year in Ruby with James, like half of 90% of it. And then I had to leave. And then I did the next year in a GT 500 brand new bone stock car. 
and that was fantastic. I would recommend anybody take a car like that and e either do like, you know, Sick Ward or something along those lines. Like you can do, what are they calling a Rocky Mountain Race Week? They call it. Yeah, the Road Weekers. Road Week. Just doing that is fun and grueling in itself. Yep. No, and that's the thing. And that's the part that like, and that's where I think that all these events like have the ability to like really take off and grow more is that Sick Ward or Road Week side of things because it's like, like, Power Tour's gotten lame. Like, literally, they're they're trying to satisfy 100,000 people to go to, like, different pit stops and different things. But yeah. there's no – there's not a lot of entertainment there. It's, like, there's not well-thought-out routes or anything. It's kind of just, oh, we're going here and we're going here. To where, like, with the sick ward or with the um, with the road weekers, I mean, that – you're experiencing – you got entertainment to you every day. You get to watch racing all day. And then – you get to cruise along with a bunch of unreliable cars that are probably on the yeah. side of the road and you're passing them. So like have your nice GT 500 with the air, the heat on, depending on conditions and take a nice picture of them as you yeah. go by and they're thrashing it's, on the side of the road. It's an interesting thing too, because some of these guys that come out there just for sick ward, like we became friends over the week. Like they'd come up to us at stops. They'd come up to me talking to me at the racetrack. And then like, before you know it, you know, day the last day they're bringing you a sandwich to the track or yep. they're getting parts for you that you needed like just these random people that you never have met before and suddenly they're kind of part of the action in a way yeah no and that's the other thing with with these type of events that like um i mean i've raced a lot and like in racers always help racers and stuff like that but like with the drag and drive stuff it's next level like it's just it's literally that's that's why there's always the thumbs up on the side of the road because if everything's okay, mm -hmm. like, and you stop on the side of the road, you're going to end up having freaking 15 cars behind you all stopped to see if there's some way that they can help you to get back on the road. Yeah. And that's the camaraderie part of it that's, that's just so cool. And it's next level. Like, racers always help racers, but, like, with the drag and drive stuff, it's just it's another, it's another tier. And I think it's that, that shared struggle that, like, you guys are – it doesn't matter if you got a 20 second car and the other guy's got a six second car. Like you guys are both, you're still in that in the exact same way. You're both yeah. struggling to make it from track to track and go down the track every day. Like if there's no easy got, out. If anybody's got parts, they, <clears throat> they sling them out to whoever needs it. And even the, the groups on Facebook, the weeks of the events are insanely flooded with people trying to help. And all the shops, I love seeing that when, like, the shops are just filled. Like, KSR shop was just, like, yep. packed with people working on their own cars. Yeah, and that's the, like, with <clears throat> coming up to Sick Week now, there's, like, so many with, like, just shops saying, oh, well, I'm 15 minutes south of here, and, like, if anybody needs anything, I got three hoists, I got this, I got mm -hmm. that, or whatever. And, like, that's that part, that stuff's just awesome. I mean, it's kind of, call it grassroots style that everybody helping everybody. Yeah, do you consider it, like, like dragon drivers are probably the toughest form of racers and probably some may say the stupidest. I mean, all racing is, <laughs> I like to consider us all kind of, um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say stupid, but we, we know what we are. <laughs> yep. We do this yep. to ourselves. Like, yeah. Literally like, yeah, no, I, it's like dropping say, a hammer on your own foot. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, I always, I always say that like, imagine, imagine waking up in the morning getting kicked in the nuts and then, like, walking outside, get kicked in the nuts. And do that about 20 times every day. Mm -hmm. That's kind of drag and drive. <laughs> like, because it's going to happen. It doesn't yeah. matter who you are or anything like that. And and there's that shared, <laughs> the the shared, um, the shared liking of getting kicked in the nuts. Yeah. That, like, everybody's in the same boat. <laughs> and Well, that too. And there's no level of, like, you can't, like, just because you had, like, it's it's an equalizer like you know somebody could have more money than you whatever but they're all still doing that same drive in a car just like you onto that next track no matter how much no matter how nice their rig is yep. sitting back at the at the start no matter how nice any of that stuff is their engine whatever it's all still an equalizer once you're on the road yeah no and that's where like uh in in a lot of the the true racers and stuff like are are starting to go towards drag and drive a lot but there's certain ones that won't because they're the ones that literally they are just the driver like there's a crew taking care of the car at the track and yep they may overlook it but the the thought of them having a wrench on that car with only them and one buddy for a week yeah. is like 
yeah, I don't know if I'm willing to do that. <laughs> so I kind of like this cushy like layout, yep. and, and we got the camp chef that's making us meals every day. And exactly, you so. got three people, four people that help you wrench on the car. You put it up on the quake jacks, all your lights around, <laughs> yep. nice and simple. And there's actually a lot to be said about the passengers on these because they have all the same struggle, but then they don't get to. Yeah, go they 170 they get the miles notoriety <laughs> and they don't get the, the fun part of it. So Yeah, they get like everything but that 1% yep. that's like the the most satisfying, I guess you'd say. Well, and that's that same part like that I've never understood where people like like our drivers and somebody else owns the car. I'm like, "How do you how do you want to go through all the expense of owning a car that's worth one tenth of yeah. what you have into it, and like then not get the good part of it of driving it down the track. Like that's the only that's the reward for yeah. all the hard work. That so. is that is the end goal. I mean, I get like you know you get to post about your wins on Facebook and stuff, and that's that that's a lot for some people. Some people like me and team owner like that. But man, I letting off the button. That's that's the that's the part right there. Yep. No, and that's the part that like I said, I don't understand how anybody would do all that investment to then mm -hmm. not get to do that part of it. So. So do you, is, are bikes coming on this one? No. No bikes on this one. Cause I know they did that on Rocky Mountain Race Week and that's. Yeah. Rocky Mountain. Yep. Rocky Mountain allows the bikes in it. And that's where like, and I mean, there's always, I mean, there's tons of inquiries about people wanting to do bikes or whatever. It's like literally like, I mean, somebody create a bike event because it's like, if these things are selling out in two minutes, it's not like I can get, I can get bringing bikes in. Like if you're trying to fill a field and like, Hey, yeah. whatever, like we need more. So maybe we'll bring in bikes too to run but it's like yeah i get like if some of these little events maybe haven't sold out you know right. at a bike side of things because there's already too many cars right there's like that's the thing like people are like why can't you have a thousand cars well go to a test and tune and try to see what it's like racing with a hundred cars yep yeah no and that's the and that's the thing it's like and um crazy like to me like to me the craziest because i mean Shit, I broke on the drive on day one last year on sick week or whatever. So then I was just following along and I had the Volvo. And, uh, but I was later getting to South Georgia last year. So I came in the back way. And number one, there's like a huge traffic jam like to get into the track. And then you get to the track and like you're looking and the track is freaking like jam packed. And there was tons of spectators there. And it's like, and it's crazy to think that, I mean, that was on a Tuesday morning mm -hmm. at like 7 a.m. And it's like, like, insane that there's so many like-minded idiots out there that yeah. are gonna say yeah this sounds like a great vacation <laughs> let's yep. let's see if we can make this piece of shit last south for five georgia days. i so. had somebody bring me that 2j sign so <laughs> oh nice <laughs> so that's that's how the fans were they were right. truly following like they brought me a bunch of stuff that they had made like it was like those fans were real dedicated fans to the dragon drivers they knew everyone even like some of the people that you may not have known yep. just from like YouTube and stuff, like they knew them from the live feeds and like what Adam was saying about them. Like that's how dedicated they were, which is cool to learn from a live feed like that. Yeah. And I think too, like, I mean, when you say like dragon driver or whatever, cause the others like literally, I mean, literally you buy the GT 500 and Hey, you know what? I mean, $2,000 in bolt-ons, you technically have a dragon drive car now. Like yeah. it, Essentially, yep, some of us are a little more extreme with what the bolt-ons that we've done, but like that's it. So so basically the the level to entry is very inexpensive and like and it's a in the other, I guess, is once again it's that great time from it doesn't matter whether you got a twenty second car. Like on the side of the road broke down, you don't know if that guy's car is a twenty second car, that car's a six second car. Like you're yeah. clueless. Like it's just his car's broke on the side of the road. So we're all in that same equal struggle. It's not the pro mod pits are over here and over here's the alcohol pits and over here's this no it's like the pits like everybody's just everywhere and yeah you just hope you park up next to somebody that maybe has the same <laughs> tools that you may need or some engine parts that you could scavenge off them or because yep. some people go through some crazy stuff i mean i watched what mike finnegan was going through on drag week yep engines out and that man never quit i was watching the video and i was like i was like just quit just give up man right. like i was like man like you're just you're, it's too much like it's too much work and he's like maybe i'll get one pass in on the last day and it's just that's the crazy mentality that i personally don't have that you know if it, if it gets to a point where i'm pulling the rods out of that thing 
She's going. She's going on the trailer. Yep. No, and that was drag week this year. I mean, that's my car. My car was like a freaking top fuel car. Like we were changing pistons every freaking time we made a pass. So it's like, but that's that whole. That is that. Call it never give up type mentality. That mm-hmm. like do whatever to then just try and try and live to the next day with it. And and a lot of it's just it's like it's it's man versus the car. And yeah. like, are you gonna let the car win, or are you gonna force your hand to win at this whole thing? And it's. To push back on you a little bit, though, is your car is definitely more built for stuff like that, like putting a piston in it if you have to. That definitely is more, it works a lot better in that chassis. Some of these guys that have like a, a street street car right. where you got to pull the K member off and take the transmission out and like all that kind of crazy stuff from the bottom. Yep. Because I'm sure yours comes out probably inside, right? Or Yeah, we can drop the pan like yeah. in the car. So. That definitely serviceability is so big on those cars yeah. i don't think people realize it's like because you have pro mod pro mod it rhymes with pro mod your car <laughs> it's not exactly <laughs> a pro mod but it definitely rhymes yeah no i mean it's just a street legal pro mod i mean that's what it is so yeah and um, two, 1.0 we're talking about because 2.0 i know you had your issues at gainesville i don't know if you want to touch in on any of the stuff that you've changed in your program since what happened with 2.0 at Gainesville that day when you had the fire? Yeah, 2.0, no. I mean, that's, I mean, you put it back together. I mean, that's obviously the one that won Drag Week this year. I mean, Mm -hmm. that's one that we didn't get. There was was lingering issues that we hadn't solved by the time we got to Sick Week last year. And um, and that just comes down to lack of time saying, yep, okay, everything's ready. If we just put this back the way it was, it'll be fine. So um, it has to be ready. Yeah. But then, but so since then we worked through stuff with it to then get it to back to where it's supposed to be. So we feel like, we feel like everything's good now. We'll see testing Monday if everything's still where it is, but it's like drag week. I mean, but aside from, aside from the injector problem, which is what then helped cause all the rest, all the problems all week were related to injectors and, uh, so now I think we have that solved. So hopefully we get some good tests Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then, I mean, hopefully it's ready to go. So so do you talk to like a few other guys like Steve Morris and them and try to use a lot of similar parts like that, like injectors and stuff, maybe fuel pumps to, so that maybe you guys can kind of have somewhat similar enough cars to where, you know, spares. We usually bring spares of everything. Swamp. So like when it, get, when it comes to the engine, obviously, I mean, the SMX deal. So you've got, you got... Me, Steve, you got uh, Clark has that. Um, I think Rocky Bowyer's coming with his Fairlane, which he has an SMX in it. So, like, so you got that part of it. When it comes to injectors, I mean, the the AFIS injectors that I'm running now, like, um, I'm the only one that I know that's running them. Uh, Steve runs a different injector. But, I mean, you just make sure, which come to think of it, it's like, they were supposed to ship me a couple spares and I don't have the spares. So it makes me think that, okay, I got to get those spares. But like, yeah. um, but most of the stuff, it's like, I just, I, you carry spares of everything that you can possibly carry to then hopefully if you carry the spare, that means it won't break. So try and carry a spare of everything because then you know, those parts won't break. What breaks is what you don't have a spare of. So typically, yeah, that usually ends up happening. You can have the spares of all your normal fail points. And then you're like, how did I've never like, I always like when I call up a company and they're like, yeah, I broke this. And they're like, it's never broken before. And I'm like, oh, I broke one. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, <laughs> yep. call me the anomaly or the, the first one. Yep. No, exactly. So I guess um, go back to your early drag and drive days. What car What car did you roll out to your first drag and drive with? Uh, 69 Camaro. We call it the... Uh called it the Indian Barrel Ground car because, like, that car, like, literally was always, it was cursed all the time. Like, I mean, there was so many, like, stuff, like you said, we would break stuff that there's no way. Like, it's it's not possible to break it. Well, yeah. I don't know. It broke. The company so, arguing with like, you, telling you it's not possible. <laughs> so, yeah, I had that, had that the first, the first year that I did Drag Week. And um, um, it was, we were, we were 15 miles from the last track and stuck lifters on the last day or whatever, like leading up to the last day. And uh, so didn't finish, was 15 miles from finishing. So, but 
it kept losing oil pressure. Oil pressure kept going down, so we kept putting more oil in it. And it's mm -hmm. like, oh, oil pressure come up for a little bit, be all right. Well, then literally, like, the oil is just filled to the top, and it's like <laughs> still no oil pressure. So it's like, oh, uh, yeah, I think she's done. Just so, a soaked cam in oil. At that exactly. Point. <laughs> at that point, it was just filled to the valve covers with oil. So, but, uh, um, so yeah, that was it. I mean, I came back with that car the next year um with actually the it would be the mule the mule motor so actually the motor that was in that's in 1.0 was in that car whatever my second year with it and finished the event didn't run real well with it but then um then i went to 1.0 the third year so but, so that's where it started to really take off what year would that have been uh that was 12 was the first year for 1.0 so 2010 and 11 was with the indian rail ground car and then, and because the engine that was in the Indian Rail Ground car, like when I built that engine, it was like it was too much power for the chassis that it was in. But mm -hmm. the idea was I was building a car the next year. Well, then 1.0 came about, and that was Denny Terzic actually built that car. And then they were ever, it was a pro charge deal, but they were never, never able to get the car sorted out to work. So then knew that they wanted to get rid of it. So then it's like, oh, well, if you guys want to get rid of it. And so then I was able to jump on it basically what would have been a two-year build to then just have a rolling chassis right away that we can put a drivetrain in so yeah that's definitely the best way to do it is not to build from scratch i always every time i i build my cars i'm like why did i build from scratch i should have just bought something yep yeah i mean the thing is though i mean from scratch you get it exactly the way you want it like that's mm -hmm. the that's the advantage the disadvantage is it costs you 10 times as much takes you 10 times as long and everything else like 2.0 is built from scratch but like um 1.0 being able to start there was like a huge cost savings and also like a, a quick turnaround that literally the next year i could race that car to where if i built one it'd be like two years to yeah. be done with it and work on getting it ready do so. you think by not building it from scratch though you realize all the things that you wanted to add on 2.0 and then you were kind of able to like refine it without because like if you build something for two years then you would have had something that you would have probably been unhappy with still because oh yeah you really yeah, have to run the, the car to know yeah and a lot of the stuff on 2.0 like yeah a lot of that stuff was learned on 1.0 to say okay well if do something else going to make sure to take this into account and that's where and we talk about cars with similar parts it's like 1.0 and 2.0 almost everything on them like aside from the engine is the same that like all the fuel pumps, everything else, it's all, both those cars have the same thing. And I actually have another car that's got the same stuff so that I literally, which now we, now we usually have enough spares, but I literally would take the other one apart to go to drag week or something because I would use that for the spares. So. Yeah. I mean, you could almost, um, wrap them both the same. And then if one breaks, you just kind of like <laughs> yeah. roll back out kind of squeeze back into the pack you know nobody notice <laughs> yeah 1.0 stock dimensions though 2.0 is not stock <laughs> oh so, yeah i mean you can tell that thing's like, not stock yeah so what else do you have um planned for that car then this year is that just with 1.0 or 2.0 or for your dragon drives for the year i guess what what do you have planned yeah, 2.0 for sick week, and then the Durango. We hope to, the Durango to be done for summer, and then we'll run the Durango at sick summer. So Okay, so I guess for people that don't know, sick week goes around Florida and then Correct. touches south Georgia, and then sick summer, right? Is yeah, sick summer's in June, and I mean, this is the first year for sick summer, but it's starting uh, uh, Cordova, so Cordova, um, Illinois, and then it'll go to Byron, Illinois, goes up to Union Grove, Wisconsin, then over to Tri-State in Iowa, and then back down to Cordova. So, Oh, that's a pretty cool route. Yeah, that's a very different, the the northern, the most northern one there is, I guess, at that point, because up into Wisconsin, that's up yeah, there. Yeah, and any of those tracks, like, uh, like, I mean, Byron, Byron, we were just there for Drag Week, and like, I mean... The most attended, like from a spectator thing, like it's just crazy. The um, the public that comes to the the Dragon Drive style races at those tracks in mm -hmm. Union Grove is, I mean, I was last time I was in Union Grove was like 15, and like on a on a Tuesday or Wednesday morning they had to lock the gate. They had to stop letting people in. Like that's a lot of people in a track yeah. to where the track actually says we can't have anymore. 
like, on a weekday. I mean, on a Wednesday, a Tuesday or a Wednesday morning. Like, I mean, just insane. Like, the pits were insane. Like, everything was crazy mm -hmm. with it. And it's like, and I don't know why no one's gone back and, like, done events through there. And it's like, so that's where, like, with the summer, we're like, well, I mean, those tracks, like, anytime I've been there, they've been awesome. So it's like, well, I want to do that. I mean, it'd be more natural for me to do it over in the Michigan area where I'm based out of. But yeah. it's like, but those tracks are just so well attended that it's like. Yeah, that's also another thing. Like, if a track like that maybe doesn't have a lot of big events throughout the year. Because, like, you know, you come down to Bradenton and you could go to a big event every other week almost. Right. And if you go up to a track that maybe doesn't have big events, like, you know, these big names that show up there for this stuff like that's a big attendance grab and anytime you can fill any track in the country i'm happy I, like right. i don't care what you're doing on the track if you're doing demo drags on the track if you're doing if if something's going down the track and you're filling up the stands that's a good thing yeah no for sure and that's yeah and that's the part that i mean with any racing it's like it like you said i mean all we want is that people stay in it and and getting the young people involved and that's where i think too that the dragon drive i mean it's great for young people because it's like literally i mean you can have a 500 hundred dollar car and go do dragon drive and you can have a riot with that like there was a uh, midwest drags last year there was a uh, a kid with a um uh, a ford ltd or whatever that he was there and like he had the time of his life or whatever like every day he'd come up and say oh i went 16 10 or whatever like on that pass yeah. or whatever and it's like dude loved every minute of it and it was it was a 1500 hundred dollar car or something but like that's so the the price to get in and then be able to hang out with all of us doing stuff is so minimal yeah and it's like and if that helps keep younger the younger generation interested in it then that's awesome. Even like cheap cars, like the first year that I was, or one of the first years I did Rocky Mountain, Doug had broken his car on day one and him and his brother went and got like a Crown Vic or something. Yep. And oh, they yeah, did the whole thing that. in the Crown yep. Vic. Yep. And I think he had more fun. <laughs> well, and that's the thing. Sometimes I think that the, whatever, the piece of crap that you don't really care about or whatever, sometimes can make the whole thing even better. Like, yeah. Then worried about how fast I well did was this right was this right or whatever like, and that's why, that's why I say the whatever the sick ward and um, stuff like that. I mean that's the that's the way to get in. Like go go participate in that and hang out for the week and do the track to track. Like you're doing everything except going down the track yeah. and like, and if you don't have the time of your life, then okay, this isn't for you. But like, literally, if you go away from it, going man, I can't wait till next year. Okay, well now maybe go buy that beater and like go enter one of the slow classes or the dial your own yep. or whatever that is and just keep taking a little bit further and see if you can handle the week right. first because and then that's also a good way to meet some people in the yep. that are already doing it because you know not everybody has friends that are going to go out and do a drag and drive event because yep no and that's the thing like when i went to my first one in 2010 i knew nobody like me and my buddy rick or whatever went there and we didn't know a soul and like, mm -hmm. but by the end of the week, we knew all kinds of people and, and, and obviously whatever, I mean, that continues to grow, but like everybody's in the same boat, like people show up there and I mean, there's solo drivers that show up there and they don't know anybody. And then, but by the end of the week, you'll see them over there and they're in some group of like 10 cars or whatever yeah. over there. And they're just all, because literally you're living, you're living all day, every day with the people that are in the event because you're at the track at 7 a.m. and you're racing until whatever, one or two o'clock. Now you're on the road with those same people following the exact same route for the next 10 hours. And then you get to the hotel at midnight. You have a couple beers in the parking lot because last thing you're gonna do is get in that car now and drive to go get something to eat. Like, so literally you're gonna be in the hotel parking lot and then you go to bed and you get up the next morning and repeat. And yeah, and if you're like me, you didn't book any hotel rooms because you didn't know if you'd make it far enough that <laughs> yeah, next night. <laughs> like, man, I better not, you know, prepay for all these rooms or location-wise because you're like, I may break down in Orlando, I may break down outside of Orlando. Like, yep, you know, getting rooms early to me is very ambitious because. <laughs> See, now you don't I was know. doing like drag week this year, literally like so day, day one. So whatever, we pushed to ring landing. So then we drove because uh, Richie Crampton's in Indy and our second stop was Indy. So drove to Indy to Richie's shop because the car was fine to drive. We just couldn't race it, get to Richie's shop and start tearing that thing down. So we left Richie's shop and went to the hotel and took a shower 
and then went to the track. Like, so we had our hotel room <laughs> for a shower. Yeah. And then that was it. And then, and then Broken Indy, went back to Richie's shop, worked on it. But then we had our 300 miles to go to get up to, um, get up to Byron or wherever we were at that next day. Um, yeah, it was Byron. So left Richie's shop at 3 a.m. and had to do 300 miles. So um, made it, or no, it was 2 a.m. We made it to the hotel and showered, had the breakfast, and then went to the track. And then the trailer broke off the car or whatever on the way to the track and whatever. So then... So then the third day, we actually, then the third day went smooth when we left Byron to get to Cordova. So no problem. We got there like nine o'clock at night or whatever. That was like heaven. We got to use our hotel room. We got to sleep. Like that Feel was weird. Yeah. You're like looking so, around. You're like, what's going to go wrong? Is the hotel going to catch on fire? Like, right. <laughs> are we going to have to like, you know, fire alarm goes off 1 a.m. Like where, what's going to happen? Because yep. when things start to go too well, you know, you start to distrust it too. Oh, for sure. And that's the, and like I said, I mean, that's the part that like, yeah, I mean, was it worth having hotel rooms? If, nope, not for our so our sake or whatever. We did get to shower there, so I mean that's a bonus. But I got lucky on sick week because I had friends that had hotel rooms already that didn't make it to them. Oh, gotcha. So I was kind of getting hotel rooms that they didn't that they were over ambitious for. Yep. I was like, all right, you know, not a bad deal. I'll take these rooms. <laughs> I would have rather them make it to the rooms, but you know, you yep. take the small wins where you get them on these deals. Because yeah, no, for sure. It's crazy how expensive things can get very quickly. Like, you know, you budget for like, okay, you know, rooms, food, this, and then suddenly parts start to break. Right. And you're overnighting stuff and you're on Facebook marketplace. You're trying to buy things locally. You're getting Ubers to bring things to you. Yep. It suddenly escalates really quickly. (laughs) Yeah. I can't, there's a lot of times that, yeah, once you. Once you get home and then the credit card statement starts coming in, you're like, what's this? Yeah. Like, and then you got to think, oh, yeah, <laughs> I forgot about that. I had that thing overnighted and <laughs> paid $300 to get a $20 part overnighted to me. <laughs> but Exactly. And then you hope that you can make it to the track that you just overnighted it to. Yep. Like, well, maybe I can limp it the next 200 miles. Uh, I mean, I, I paid day one last year on sick week to rebuild my transmission because power glide let go huge mess uh but we'll go into that one but uh let go day one and then let go again day five in um on our way back from georgia so it's cool it was like a bought day one cooked her again (laughs) day five yep no and that's the and that's the thing like i mean that's yeah drag week Drag week this year was my hardest drag record last year, 22. But, like, that's the thing. I mean, I I broke my transmission testing on Sunday. Yeah. No, testing on... Testing on Saturday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, testing Saturday. So, so right then, before the event. Yeah, so then Nick Taylor drove my transmission from St. Louis to Pennsylvania to then get the thing freshened and redone on Sunday got to the track, got back to the track with it like 9 p.m. or whatever Sunday night when the event starts Monday. So I went through tech line to get the car teched in on Sunday by pushing it because I had no transmission in it all day and put the transmission in it. Like I said, got done putting the transmission 10 o'clock Sunday night. So the event didn't even start yet. The event started Monday morning and was already thrashing that you got the transmission out of it and putting it back in again. So yeah, there's uh, there's that week before the event that the cameras don't see that yep. thirteen twenty doesn't cover and isn't on the live feeds and stuff. That is absolutely insane for most people, especially these last few years where parts have been a little harder to find. I'm sure people's Plan B, C, and D cars have had trouble getting parts for them. Yep. So there's that whole hell week, I guess you could call it, leading up to it. And then the week after where you're catching back up on everything that you just missed out on. <laughs> no, and that's the thing. is like it, in this year especially, like right now, it's like we've had some people been able to come in off the wait list because, I mean, we didn't have hardly any drops. And then, then now all of a sudden, like in the last week, it's like I'm still waiting on parts. I'm not going to have this done. Like, So literally, I mean, they're holding out hope up until like two weeks before yeah. that – 
they're going to have their parts to get their engine together, or get whatever together, then then be able to make it. That they're so. I mean, they've they're die hard that it's taken them this long to then say, yeah, yeah. I got to throw in the towel. Like I can't. Well, I'm sometimes not it, so parts companies promise things that they don't, they can't deliver on. Not like sometimes, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> How long does it take to get this? Two weeks. Sweet. Maybe I should have asked which two weeks because... <laughs> yeah. Two weeks after you were supposed to have it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you said two weeks. It's been eight weeks. Yeah, we weren't sure. But... That's why you order from Motion Raceworks. So, exactly. <laughs> not, a, not a sponsored plug, but... <laughs> yep. Doug's a good sponsor of mine, so... <laughs> yep. No, yep. and that's... Yeah, because you'll get the stuff, so... And there are... A, huge part of this too because they bring their trailer with parts and tools and whatnot and help people along the way and things like that things like the portable car hoist like those kind of guys that are background to what's act like the racers help so much i've seen i saw so many people have to go to that motion raceworks trailer yep yeah no and that's what's and that's what's awesome and that's the part that like with with any sponsorships that we're doing like for our events it's like we want people to be intimately involved with it. So like motion is and gear vendor is and stuff is like, hey, we want you there. Like have cars there. Like be part of it. Don't just don't mm-hmm. just be the sponsor or whatever. Like integrate yourself with the event. And that's where like, I mean, um, someone's another one that they have their parts trailer there. And then like uh, Holly with the nitrous that they're doing all the free fills there. And then VP with the fuel that like that was a big deal for us to make sure that VPs there with fuel every day and like I mean they have the best sponsorship there is because we're buying fuel from them but like yeah. but the convenience that the fuel is there every day that you're not fitting it in your trailer or in your car and you're able to just go buy the jugs of fuel that you need that day like to me that's one of those priceless things that like yeah because there's um, a lot of methanol guys yep that need that M1 and it's kind of VPs kind of got the market on M1 so, yep. Yeah. And I mean, even, even the Q stuff, whether it's Q16 or C16 yeah. or any of that stuff too, it's like just being able to get all that readily available at the track every day. Cause it's like, that's where a lot of events, it's always, it's always, well, what's fuels going to be available? What track, like how did, what do we have to carry? What don't we have to carry? And that's where like, um, like Matt with, um, with race week or whatever, he does his a little different, like that he actually just, he carries fuel for people. Like you go give it to them. Like if you're going to need 25 gallons, yeah. go give him the pails and then he'll make sure it gets to the track every day so that you get your fuel. So, and that's how he overcame the fuel stuff that literally you can get to some BFE track and they're like, oh yeah, we got, we got uh 93. Do you need some 93? Yeah. We <laughs> so, put this in our tractor. Yeah, exactly. Use this in the mower out back. So. I mean, like, <laughs> Yeah, because once you go out to those, you know, tracks that are truly in the middle of nowhere, yep. which is the fun part of this is going on the back roads, because I've been in Florida for years now, and those were roads I still had never driven on. Oh, really? That's I good. mean, a lot well, of Well, that's yeah. the thing. is like Luke came out with the route for day one, and it was going to be more four over to like 75, and then there was all kinds of complaints like, no, we don't want, because like literally the Bradenton to South Georgia, that's expressway. Like that's whatever. Yeah. It's 300 miles of hell. So like no just take the it. fastest way to get there. But um, but then he's like, all right. Then he changed the route to make sure it's off the back roads and stuff. And that's yeah. like, and that's the part that obviously is cool. Like, I mean, there, I mean, there's nothing cooler than when you're cruising down the road in like in, um, in classic car, or like race, whatever car and that you see all these other cars like and and the people like that's the other cool part too is like the people on the side of the road just looking like the casual onlookers and like and like you roll into the gas station there's like five of you getting gas at the same time and there's all the locals are in there going oh this is insane i gotta send my buddy a picture of this and like and people were lighting up because like they were just like i had never seen cars like this before and like you could be in the most simple car and like sometimes they're just like they're blown away by it. And then you see all the other ones come by a couple trailer burnouts here and there. Yep. Unofficial, but the unofficial trailer <laughs> burnouts that, that happens on like, you can blame 1320 for that one. So, yep. <laughs> that was Kyle Loftus's fault, yep. <laughs> but that's it's all, all part just, of the fun. And the, that's all just clutches slipping. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, it the foot slipped. So yeah, you drive through some dirt and you got to get the dirt off real <laughs> yep. quick or something. Exactly. <laughs> The, the gruelingness of what I've seen people have to do is insane. Like, what what have you have to had to do to get to the next track that you just feel like, 
just too much. Like I was watching one guy that had to stop every 10 minutes to put six bags of ice on his motor wow. and then drive another 10 minutes because like they had kicked the head gaskets out. There's no coolant in the motor. They made it to the last track, but wow. they were icing it down and they had like a, you know, 12 pack of bush light on there too because you're going to need it after you exactly. get done with the event. Yeah, one for me, the rest for the car. Maybe <laughs> yeah. it'll cool down. So. I think even I saw Steve had his transmission out a couple times yep. on sick yeah. week. Yeah, he broke his transmission in South Georgia. So, and then um, Prospero and those guys helped him rebuild the thing in the pits and put mm -hmm. it back in the car. And I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't the same after because it needed some parts, but it was enough for him to finish the week. So, and, yeah. and that's the thing, like when you, when you're sitting there and it's three o'clock in the afternoon and this car that we know has to be in another town to race the next morning and the transmission is sitting on a garbage can or whatever in the parking lot with all the parts laying everywhere. Yeah. And, and you got four or five guys that like, literally they're ready to go. Their car is packed and ready to leave the track, but they're staying there and helping rebuild this transmission to help this other guy get on the road so we can make it to the next track. And, and to them, it, they, they weren't even doing them a favor. They were just doing what they do. Like, it's not like, Oh, I'll stay in. No, they never even thought it, twice about it. Well, because like, the next night, it might be you right, sitting there exactly at 3 a.m. And you may need some of those transmission parts that maybe just came out of there. And that's the other nice thing about using like a like a big block or a turbo 400 and a power glide is because there are local shops all over the place that may have clutches for those or a Sprag or a converter or something like that. Like they're pretty readily available components. And some people build so intelligently with so many readily available components that I think they really kind of saved themselves on the back end. Right. Oh, no, for sure. Like, yeah, there's a lot of people that definitely that put their stuff together with as many AutoZone parts catalogs or whatever as they can mm -hmm. to say that AutoZone always stocks this. So I'll run this one because yeah. I know it'll probably be at an auto parts store locally. That's why, like, the LS stuff is nice oh. and the Mustang parts. Like, I broke a wheel last year. Like, I actually broke a wheel up there. I had a caliper go through it. And before the event, I made it to a junkyard, found another wheel for $20, made it to some used tire shop, had them swap my tires for me because <laughs> I couldn't run on my, I broke it on my race tire. So okay. I couldn't run yep. my street tires at that point. So I kind of had to, you know, it's one of those do or, yep. do or go home situations. <laughs> and that kind of stuff is, um, it's fun because it kind of tests your mental fortitude and capacity oh yeah things. yeah if you're yeah if you got a if you got a, a short fuse drag and drive isn't for you because <laughs> like literally you know that you're going to be tested all day every day so like if you go off at the first sight of something then yeah it might not be your cup of tea <laughs> so yeah. but if you can if if you look for the solutions rather than complain about the problem then that's what drag and drive is about it's always finding solutions <laughs> Yeah, find the problem as quick as possible so that yep. you can then start on the solution as soon as you can. Right. And <laughs> yeah. you can be mad about it the next week, but like <laughs> right in that instance, just solve yeah. the problem. <laughs> so. And there's also, unfortunately, there's something to be said about giving up. Like if you have a problem, like I've been here where you have a problem, you're trying to solve it and you're just throwing parts at it, throwing parts at it. You never solve the problem, right. but now you're five grand into throwing parts at something or, you know, hundreds yeah, of dollars but, into it. But you got to look at it and say you're $5,000 into knowing what's not wrong. So, like, <laughs> And it's still not right. This is crazy. I could have just built the car again because <laughs> some of us are out there with, I, I think I, I valued my car. I, I did every single part. It was like 30 grand to exactly duplicate it. And it was, it's a 1050 car, but it's. Good enough to where if it gets T-boned on the side of the road, I'm not. It's bad enough to where if it gets T-boned on the road, I'm not mad. But it's good enough to where I can have a good time with it and still run 1050s, which is kind of my level of street. Because some of these Florida drivers worry me a little bit here. Yep. Driving something too nice. Right. And then no, suddenly sure. you got the person hanging out the window trying to record you. Driving their truck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's where it gets really scary. Well, I don't know if they're still driving their truck. They're just busy trying to record you. The truck's kind of driving itself. Yeah. So. 
sometimes it gets a little scary. And then on the highway, my car started bucking, transmission going out on I-75. I'm like, oh, man, some 18-wheeler is going to come up on. <laughs> but um, Steve's car, I found really trick how he did his roof rack. That was super cool. Yeah, he actually, though, he switched. He's re- he's bringing a trailer this year. Is he? Yeah, because it's still like Aiden. Not heavy. Aiden does the roof rack. and um, But that's the thing. It's like any time when, like, a trailer, you unhitch it. Mm-hmm. trailers off roof rack we got unload everything off the roof rack take the roof rack off like there's all yeah. there's a lot of stuff that goes into the whole thing to where that's where steve when i was at his shop like last week he has a trailer he's like i'm doing a trailer now because it's just it's too easy to do a trailer compared to all the stuff you go through with the roof rack yeah i had everything just loaded in the back seat of my car last year and it's as convenient as it is not to have a trailer and budget friendly it is to not have a trailer it's definitely not the most fun yeah that's my indian barrel ground car we didn't no trailer it was like wedge everything in behind the seats and like every nook and cranny of the car had stuff in it Hmm. but like a track every day now you're spending freaking an hour getting all that stuff out of the car so that you can take it up but now you gotta put it all back in the car so we're like a, a trailer for the most part you close the door and like you're like okay we're good so I love seeing like the overachiever trailers where you open up the side, all the tools are like, you know, all clean and like everything's like exactly has a spot. And then you see it the last day, yep. <laughs> all the tools are gone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nothing has a spot anymore. Like yep. the trailers There's on just spare a wheels. Full of tools. <laughs> like. it, it always starts out so promising. And if it comes back and it looks the same, you probably didn't try hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. You could have done better. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what'd you do? You missed some days or something? <laughs> yep. Yeah, I mean, even us, like, I think some people probably got lucky. I, I probably got lucky that Orlando was canceled because my transmission was on borrowed time. So it would have either broke all the way in South Georgia or halfway back like it broke. <laughs> so, right. So sometimes people kind of get lucky on that deal and then... Driving through the rain, I think, helped us a lot because kept the cars a lot cooler. Right. But then that night driving, I was I was in a full race suit. <laughs> I was so cold. Yeah, it was chilly. Like, no, that's the thing is like, yeah, I was when um, when it's cold enough that you're trying to roll the windows up inside the car. Like, I mean, hardly ever would my car ever have the windows up. But there's times where it's like. Yeah, can we roll these up? Like, try and keep all this heat from the transmission in the car because it's cold. So, How bad does it get with, like, fogging up those windows and stuff, driving that thing? Yeah, if you close it up, then it does. But, like, if you, as long as it stays open the way that it needs to be, then usually not a problem. Pretty well-sealed cabin in there and stuff. So, yeah, but it's, like, but it's whatever. I mean, the car runs, like, the interior runs at the trans temp. So, Mm -hmm. like, that's... Whatever the trans is, that's what the interior is. So. That makes sense. So, do you think a small tire car is going to beat the big tire cars this year? Do you think it's uh, going to happen? Because it's, it's been pretty close, right? I think Rick Prospero, he, he was up there last year. Yep. Yeah, he was second. And then Mike with the, uh, with the Volvo Wagon was third. So, I mean, yep. that's the first time that any radial cars or small tire cars were in the top three at all, um, at any event. So, um, so, I mean, there's definitely, I mean, cause the track prep, I mean, that's the thing is the tracks prepped for small tires. And I mean, at the end of the day, like, I mean, my car on small tires is faster than it is on big tires. So, I mean, it just yeah. comes down to slipping versus sticking. So consistency like, to and, be able to do it. And that's the, so so like all that's there for the taken like will will one of the will one of the real fast cars like actually um go on slicks or go on radials to do it i mean i don't see why not i mean i i thought about it for half a second on mine because i mean i've had my car on um well and 315s aren't technically small tires anymore but it's still a radial but like i've thought about putting 315s or whatever on my car and because the track prep, I mean, that's the, that's the part that, I mean, you get a, you get good track service like we have for sick week. And I mean, you do have the ability to go real fast on small tires. It's usually the, the limiting factor at a lot of the events, but yeah. Yeah. So that's where sick week has a big 
leg up on you know the Midwest events because all of the Florida tracks that you guys that we go to are insanely well set up, known worldwide known tracks. I mean, right. Bradenton is like the best track in the country right now. South Georgia's always been the best. Orlando's always got great prep, and then um, Gainesville is kind of the wild card. Right. It could be hit or miss. You never, you don't really know. Yep. No, and that's where with us, I mean, we're bringing in, we're bringing our own, like VP's our glue sponsor. And like, I mean, we bring our own prep guys like Gainesville. I mean, they spent two days getting Gainesville ready last year mm -hmm. for us. And I mean, same thing's happening this year that, that um, KJ's crew is going to be there the day before getting it ready and to try and make sure that we give all the best tracks as possible, because that's the part, I mean, that's, call it splitting hairs between people to me it's like i want to give everybody the best track they possibly can have so that their car can run the best like and yeah i don't want to run a no prep drag and drive so um and some people will be like oh well that's we don't like that all the tracks are on set to kill and all of that it's like well to me it's like six weeks like the super bowl so that's it like yeah. this is the one where all the records should be broken and where Everybody should be able to make their fastest passes. And, and last year we got the complaints about the track being too good. I'm like, I'll take those complaints all day. Yeah, you those tell are me fun. all day how the track was too good. <laughs> like, and, but a lot of people that came last year and possibly come this year like, have never been on tracks that good because, I mean, I've been coming down here for, uh, for years racing. Well, you're down here. So, I mean, you know the killer tracks or whatever they're down here in, like, these killer setups. Well, there's a lot of people that have never been on track surfaces that are that good, and they really don't know what to do with it. I mean, mm -hmm. because they, did, they do their local test and tune where the guy does a little spray and calls it good, and maybe they drag the track, and, yep, you're good to go. Like, it's all yeah. That thing's set to kill now. Like, On top of it, the so. DA is way better. We're low altitude. We're cool weather time of year. Like, you go up to the mountains. Right. And no matter how good the track is, yep. your car is down on power. I know your car was just on the dyno. I didn't I didn't see what it made, though. So, yeah, we, I mean, we were just tuning the injector. So we did 40 pounds of boost is where I stopped at. And it was like 2,900 to the tire. So, oh, that's a nice, healthy... But, so healthy, a lot of power. I mean, but, I make like 15 and I'm excited about it. So, yeah, well, we usually run 60, 70 pounds of boost. So that was 40. So, but I do too, but I still only make like <laughs> 1,500 horses. <laughs> I guess three liter is the difference on that one. It's, it's fun that you do, um, you highlight the wild engine combinations. Like you have the rotaries and stuff like that. And there's like the diesel combinations and, Personally, I think a diesel engine is a really good one to bring because the fuel doesn't matter. Right. They get great gas mileage with a good sized turbo, and then they, it seems like a good combination to do for a drag and drive. But I don't think I've seen any diesels really do anything crazy. Yeah. Um, well, there's a couple that said that truck, I mean, that, that one truck runs pretty good, and then um, uh, Fleetus or whatever with that Chevelle with the Duramax in it. Like, mm -hmm. that car runs good. Um, now, good, like, running in the sixes? No, not yet. But I think that, um, I mean, we're starting to see a lot of the um, a lot of the diesels start to go real fast, like, in the pro racing bracket. So it's like, you know that's going to trickle down. And that, I mean, people are really going to start to figure it out, like, in this, call it drag and drive, smaller, lower bracket. But yeah. Yeah, it's but kind of, um, it's like an unlimited almost because you're not class racing where somebody's telling you what turbo you can run and yep. what size everything you can have down to the pound and stuff like that because class racing gets crazy. So you can kind of go unlimited, which makes it really wide open. Oh, and that's the part too, like with uh, like the um, Boost Boys and PFI Speed guys and stuff like with a lot of that um with a lot of the import stuff to me that stuff is cool like the first import domestic versus domestic race that i went to like i fell in love with all that crap because literally when the turbo is the size of the engine and mm -hmm. like some of that rotary stuff or whatever it's like how the hell like are you anywhere comparison to my freaking 600 cubic inch big block like literally you're like right there running neck and neck with like 200 cubic inches yeah. like and 
just crazy. I mean, that's, I mean, if some guy would bring his damn Camaro and not be a chicken about it or whatever, like that's just a freaking awesome car. That, I like... know. I know. I am definitely a chicken about it. I have, I have two other events the next like 30 days after sick week. So I'm like, man, it's really going to hurt me if I can't run those two next events because I ran the first one. Right. So I'm like, maybe I'll just go out, you know, do the same thing as last year and come, complete the event because the mustang does deserve it deserves to complete the event in my eyes that's what you say now maybe in a month let's see if that's still what you say that freaking mustang like i hate that car oh yeah i mean if, if it doesn't complete this i'm i'm rebuilding the whole thing I'm, I'm redoing all of it i don't care everything's for sale on that thing if it doesn't complete this dragon drive but granted i should probably be putting more energy into making sure that car is ready for it but for 1050, it can run a 1050, and then the rest is just hopefully it can make the drive. And you can't really go test a thousand mile drive in right. your car. Like I'm not just gonna go like, all right, I gotta go test this thing, make sure it can drive a thousand miles, because yep, no, and that's then you're the, not gonna be able to drive two thousand. <laughs> no, and that's the thing, because that's like like 2.0. I mean, we changed so much with the cooling system, and everything went to a smaller radiator. Like I mean, a bunch of stuff just trying to make it better. And it's like, but literally sick week is its test like mm -hmm. will the smaller radiator work and everything that we changed we think so but like we're not going to go take it for like some 500 mile drive or whatever say yep it all works it's hey. yeah we'll just show up at sick week and <laughs> if it starts overheating then we're like oh wonder what we can do now <laughs> like yeah. we're the guys with the six bags ice on it like, yeah driving down the road every 10 miles like, well, i idled it for an hour and it didn't uh it didn't overheat so yep. i guess uh i guess it's good yep i think it's probably fine like but, yeah, and I think people don't realize that trans temp is is a real killer on those on oh, yeah. on drag and drive cars because like, you know, most cars like you look at your coolant temp and you're like, oh, cool, it's good, but like, a lot of people don't even know their transmission temperature. Yep. Yeah. Nor do they know how much it's slipping. So once you have a converter that has a lot of slip in it, all of a sudden you're just blowing through your transmission, and that's the kind of stuff that is overlooked. Yep. So what would you tell the newbie? What would you what would you explain to the newbie that's like I got a thousand horsepower car I'm gonna go run eight fifty class yeah, never done one of these before to me all I tell anybody because they're I mean usually it's usually it's say hey, I want to do one of those but like I don't like my car's not quick enough right now or I got to do this or whatever I'm like then you're going about it all wrong like mm -hmm. first go do it like I mean because believe me like you will forget about how fast you're going down the track by day two. Because now your your sole worry is going to be, can we make it to the next track? Like, so charging and cooling. I mean, those are the two things that probably the the most common killer is either the car's not running cool enough, it's getting hot because driving it to Dairy Queen is not the same as driving it to Gainesville. Yeah. So like, I mean, it's and on back roads, like not expressway where you're forcing air through anything. I mean, literally you're stop and go traffic for six hours, like. Your campground cruiser is not going to usually make that. So, um, and then charging. Well, I mean, almost everybody, it's electric fans, electric water pump, electric everything. And like, so now all of a sudden you got an alternator in there out of a freaking 72 Nova that like, it can't put out the power that's required of the system. So, yeah. so now you're like, oh, I won't keep a charge and whatever. I mean, those are charging and cooling are like the two things that are always... I see them get more people than anything else. So yeah, fuel pumps take a lot of amperage, yep. especially these new like 10.0s that are louder than most engines. Yep, those things take up a lot of amperage, and then even fueling wise, you know, people try to get really fancy with how they do two tanks and run on this, drive on that. That kind of stuff can get a little tricky. I mean, I know Doug Cook had his issues with it, so it's kind of like. Where's your take on over-engineering stuff or just, like, stuff that works because that's also a balance? Yeah, no, and I think that that's where, like, I mean, I usually come out of every event with changes that want to make, and most of them don't have to do with making the car any quicker. It's always trying to, like, make something a little easier to change or better, like the cooling system, the fact that we redid all that. Um, I mean, it's not because it was running hot, but it's, like, 
I think we can get some weight off of it. But at the same time, I think not just to save the weight, but to make the whole cooling system more efficient. Because my mm -hmm. system was a pain. It always had air in it. Like we, no matter what, we could never get all the air out of the system. So you'd sit there and listen to the water pump and you'd hear it aerate for a second and then pump everything again. And it's like, so I mean, we like went back to the drawing board with the whole thing and started over to where we ended up with a lot smaller radiator and uh, in the way we did everything's different. And now, like I said, it doesn't aerate the pump anymore. Like, I mean, so I think it's all good, but, and that's the, that's the part with any of that. And the fuels, the fuels, I mean, it comes down to like, I mean, you want to try and, you want to try and not have to pump out all your race gas to put in pump gas or vice versa, like at the track. Like if you can come up with a way to manipulate with valves or like you said, two tanks or whatever that is, like everything that everything that you say, well, it only takes 15 minutes. Well, <laughs> add all those 15 minutes up when you're trying to yeah. get ready to make a pass or whatever on day two, you only got two hours of sleep the night before and all those 15 minutes add up. So the quicker that you can convert your car from street to race or whatever race fuel to um to pump gas or any of those things i mean that plays off in spades because that 15 minutes you're doing twice a day every day so in all those 15 minutes add up and you may show up to the track with only an hour left in the runtime right you know or even less than that sometimes like i've seen people roll through why everybody's leaving Trying yep. to get their one pass in just to break the beams at least. And then another interesting rule is you can't use your trailer to have any external cooling or anything like that and charging. Because I'd imagine I've seen some people do some crazy things with trailers in the past where people had like machine shops basically on their trailer. Right. So I guess that is that where that rule kind of was born or yeah, had somebody well, done it? You know, I don't... I don't know if anybody did it. There was always like a lot of talk about it, but the the idea was that the and and whatever. And sometimes I I wonder about that idea because it's like um, like the generator. So I mean, almost all of us have a generator on a trailer. Like mine's mounted on the front of the trailer. Like I mean, it would be nothing if I had a charging issue for me to have a charger plugged into that generator, charging mm -hmm. the battery going down the road. Now. Um, the coolness factor for the event is now I got to take that generator off the trailer. I got to mount it to the roof of the car, plug that charger in, and now it's legal. So yeah. it's not legal running the extension cord from the trailer forward. <laughs> but if I put the generator on the car and the charger, then that's perfectly legal. Um, and then fuel stuff. I think a lot of it was like, okay, well, they're going to put a 30 gallon fuel tank in their trailer and then run a couple lines. And then now you can have, you can basically, you two and a half gallon race tank, you never have to change it because now all you're doing is pumping out a 30 gallon tank in the back and that's what's keeping your car running, driving down the road. Yeah, you, um, if, I mean, a couple dry connects and you could have a transmission cooler back there, or you right. could have whatever. Yeah, so it's like, so it's, it, it, so I think it was probably created to try and keep, try and keep the pro mods or whatever out of doing it mm -hmm. um, to make it different where they had to engineer stuff better in the car to be able to do it. But but like I said, sometimes I, sometimes I, I, I question it because sometimes I think, man, it might be cool if somebody came up with this kick-ass trailer that like literally does have the trans cooler mounted back yeah. there. It's got a big fuel tank back there. It's got like, I mean, a couple dry connects or whatever. And yeah. like, Hey, this thing's ready to go. And now the trailer is supporting the car or whatever going down the road. And, but not ready to change that rule yet. But I, I to me, like the creativity that it could bring is the part that I look at and say, well, that might be pretty cool. Yeah, like, that could be fun. Like it's like a whole, you know, for like the real engineering minds out there could really do some interesting stuff with that. Right, and that's the thing. Would like to just like you say, like with the all the tools organized in the trailer and stuff. Like I, I don't know. I can imagine like how cool, how kick ass or whatever. Like literally, yep, I race, and then I hook the trailer up and plug these three things in, and I'm yep. ready. Like it's charging, and, it's transmission fluid is like now i have 10 gallons of transmission fluid all of a sudden yeah i mean i like i said i mean it's illegal to do that right now yeah. but but sometimes i say well i don't know it might be cool that that was illegal because that might be the creativity that could come out of it might be kick ass because so. once you well once you have a size for your trailer rule it kind of all it almost nothing really matters i guess what you do on the trailer 
in my mind, like, cause you know, you're already limiting the size. You can only do, can only fit so much in a finite space. So it kind of makes it. Well, that rule is gone though. The size of the trailer is gone. It's single axle. Single so, axle. Okay. Yeah, but still, it, I mean, there was the cubic feet or whatever, which mm -hmm. equivalent of four by eight. And then it's like, um, then Matt with Rocky Mountain went, did away with that rule. Drag Week had that rule, and then we had that rule. Well, and then since then, it's like, yeah, it's single axle trailers fine. Like, if somebody wants to bring a pop up trailer behind their car, then bring a pop up trailer. Like, yeah. I mean, the hope is that you don't get the full machine shop. Like, you don't get all those other things come into play. So, I guess the other thing with the trailer rule too, though, is like, like literally, if you did the, if you did take away that rule, now. What's to stop somebody from putting a Tesla drivetrain in their trailer that now the trailer pushes the car from track to track? Yeah. Like the big battery pack and yep. a drive axle in there. And I'm just a neutral. Like <laughs> I've often wondered about that, like with a pro mod, if you had some kind of electric drivetrain in it and suddenly you can have a, you know, I mean, your car is already pretty extreme. I don't think a electric drivetrain would really help you much. Right. Like, you can already handle the drives from track to track. I don't think there's more engine you can really do unless you have like a 950 cubic inch nitrous motor maybe that has like an electric motor kind of pull it along and no cooling system for the car. Right. For weight wise. Yeah. That would be the only real benefit. Cause well, and that's the thing is some of the stuff you're like, okay, well maybe like maybe that is like, I mean like death week is going to be like more about the adventure i mean less about the the racing side of it because of the tracks there and like just the drive and everything's gonna be grueling but but maybe that maybe there is a place for like some no rules event that literally like whatever you want to do with the trailer whatever like literally mm -hmm. like i mean you put a tesla drive train in the trailer that's fine it's legal here like this event it's yeah. legal like because let's see before we try and change rules anywhere else yeah let's see how far people can take it so that's the thing, so. I guess. You, when when you build these cars, you have to take like an average of the rules. Like you look at all the events, and you're like, okay, if I do these rules, you can kind of close to every event, so you can just change little things. Because if you go, if you know, if you came out with rules that were vastly different than other events, it would be tough because you know the guy that races Rocky Mountain Race Week then can't fit into Sick Week, and vice versa. So that's kind of where it, like, it's like with radial tire racing. They all kind of use the same rule book. They all have the same rule maker. It, it kind of makes it simple. So it kind of, it, it definitely helps a lot. What classes, though, are you excited to see for this year? Because there's some that seem like they're blowing up, like, 235 seems yeah, really the, interesting. Yeah, the Rowdy Radio, like, yeah, I think that that's, that's the one that, like, even last night with Doug or whatever, like, just saying, I don't know if we create a monster with this because it's, like, really there is no rule. Like yeah. my car, I could put two thirty fives on my car and I could run Rowdy Radio. Like it, there's no rules. So like, will it quickly get way out of hand that like that the tire is really the only rule? And but but we'll see. I mean, I think that there's going to be some fast cars on two thirty fives. Um, I think it's cool. I think to a certain degree, it's like eighth mile. Um, if the whole event was eighth mile for everybody, then that's one thing. But we've got the we got the one class that's eighth mile, and I feel like the wear and tear on their car for eighth mile isn't the same as everybody else that's running quarter mile. And yeah. so, like, I worry, like, it, it, I don't worry, but, like, are we giving them an advantage that their car is going to easily be able to be more reliable? Because usually, usually I only break my car in the second eighth. The first eighth, it's usually always good. It's mm -hmm. the second eighth where it breaks. And so are we, are we giving people too much advantage by by just doing the eighth mile but same as like a 235 tile you can't run a 235 tire out the back like it's yeah. just i mean literally you'd have to have an you'd have to have a whatever like you'd have to have an engine that turns thirteen thousand rpm or something to be able yep. to run the damn thing out the back like well that's why it's going to be interesting because gearing wise if you're really trying to maximize that tire in the eighth mile you're going to really struggle to drive that thing on the street. Yeah, so are if, you going to change that rear gear now to make it from track to track? I get like, you put a taller tire on it to drive it on the street, but like if you're really trying to push a car eighth mile, you're not you don't have a street gear in the back of that thing. Right. You don't have a 70 mile an hour cruising gear in that thing or right. 60 mile an hour. So like yes. Yeah, so 75 from Bradenton to South Georgia will suck. Like, yeah. 
So, like, maybe you created a monster, or maybe those guys are going to find out real quick. <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, maybe that's the great equalizer's the road that, like, yep, that's all good. It looked great in the eighth mile or whatever, but, man, that 300 miles mm -hmm. is going to suck. Yeah, because, so. like, imagine gearing your car for eighth mile. Yep. That's going to suddenly extremely change how you would have to drive that thing on the road. Yep. And no matter how many gear vendors you got on that thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can't do enough to make up for that tall of a gear. So Yeah, I think that'll be a cool one. And then stick shift's always fun to watch. And yep. I know that there's a few guys that come down from Canada and up north every year. Chad from the Midwest is coming out with his stick shift car. And yeah, and I mean you're getting on me over here. I hope you're getting on Garrett too. Because he kind of abandoned stick shift drag and drive racing. I'll say it. <laughs> yep, because he wanted to go faster. But, uh, um, no, and that's the, yeah, so, I mean, any of stuff, and that's, like, Doug, uh, I had dinner with, like, Doug and Andy last night, and we were just, like, on the top of our hand, and I don't know whether we count right or not, but we had, like, 15 cars that we'd counted that are, like, six-second or faster cars that are going to be at sick week, and it's, like, it's just insane, like, so how many classes are going to end up where a six-second pass isn't even good enough, like, that, mm -hmm. I mean, you just you have a six second street car, but like you might be fifteenth like yeah. on the list, and it's like what the hell? Like how is how bad is this getting? But like, I mean, in and we can look at it in that perspective, but then also it's the same as like I mean, obviously sick week we're trying to get the fastest ones all together, but like we still don't have a hundred cars faster than eight fifty. So like if you have the best cars in the country, like all the best ones that go there, and we're still not at a hundred, they run faster than 850 like i mean that's that tells you like no matter how common we think that an eight second car is it's not that common yeah so i think yeah i think the the separation grows a lot like from the six second cars to the 850 cars and then beyond like the the separation they start start to get really scattered towards the top way less at the top but the ones that are at the top are all kind of at the same point at the top. Right. But then there's a big gap after them because there's then like eight second cars. You have like the unlimited six second cars and then mo a lot of the classes are like 850, it seems yep. like. And that's a good spot because you run out of cage really quickly at 850. Right. So you either go from an 850 cage car to a 25.3 full legitimate race car which makes everything a lot more difficult of course well and that's how we started and that's how the the 235 the rally radio really piqued the interest i mean matt did it first with rocky mountain race week but that's where it's like okay well now you've got rather than these 850 cars turning into bracket cars because they're cage limited not to go faster than 850 it's mm -hmm. like okay well let's put 235s on them and do eighth mile now they can go, now they can run the car to the potential. I mean, that's that's really what is based on is being able to get those guys out of being the 850 bracket car that, hey, if you run an eight, 852 or whatever, like on day two, you might as well, you're out. Like yeah. there's no way you can compete because there's so many people have the 850 dialed in. So the idea of the 235 was to let those people go faster because we're a quarter mile event. So we have quarter mile clocks. But 235 class will be placed based on their eighth mile results. So, yeah, so they'll just, you know, their boards will probably light the quarter mile and then they'll just. Correct. And when they and see don't their run slip. faster than 850 in the quarter mile. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. So, because you're going to be cage limited not to run faster than 850. That makes sense. So, even if they did want to run it out the back, they're so. going to get. They're going to get reprimanded, I guess, in some way. Well, yeah, you can't run faster than 850, so you can't turn in a quarter-mile slip faster than 850 if you've only got an 850 cage in your car. Mm -hmm. so, and some of these cars... We're doing awards based on eighth mile. Mm -hmm. So so some of these cars that are running, you know, 450s are probably going to be what we're seeing out of some of these 230, 235 cars. I wouldn't be surprised to see a couple 450s. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I mean, that's like that'd be cool if, like... They get that fast, and that's where like a lot of people are like, "Oh, well, five O's." I'm like, I really think fours are going to be where it's at. Hundred like, percent. I mean, that's literally we're we're taking the training wheels off and saying, 
hey, we're going to reward you based on your eighth mile time on your quarter mile pass. Mm -hmm. And like, so that gets you by, um, that gets you by like a lot of things that lets you do that because it's like speed. To me, it's, to me, that's the part. Like that's, speed is what kills. So it's like, literally, I don't, like if you got an 850 car, okay, an 850 car is what, 145 miles an hour or whatever, or 135, I think it's 135. But like yeah. something like that, that's your speed. To me, that speed should be the factor. Like in the eighth mile, you better not go faster than 135. Like that's, that to me should be what it is. It shouldn't be associated with a number. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, I mean, you know, completely off topic, but once you look at like the Lamborghinis that run 190 miles an hour, but sometimes don't even go sevens right. because they 60 foot so badly and can't 330. And then all of a sudden they're just like huge horsepower at the back. It doesn't matter what their ET was. It's that mile an hour is insane. Right. Yeah, exactly. You correct that car at that. It is not like, it's not going to be safe. I mean, no. I'm sure. So. And I mean, you dealt with that last year where your son, he was on his roof, right? Yep. It was him in the car, I think, at yep. the time. Yeah. Yep. And thankfully, that car had a ton of safety in it, but it seemed like he walked away pretty, relatively pretty easily from that deal. Yeah. Emotionally shaken up pretty good, but yeah. physically, he was perfectly fine. So. <laughs> yeah, that, that definitely will get you a little bit. Well, um, but you got to get back on the horse, right? So, yep. Yeah. And that car's, that's the thing he was supposed to ride with, with Joey Barry or whatever at Sick Week. But Joey's not going to be done with his car. Well, Aiden's car is almost done, but it's we weren't pushing it to get it done because he's going to run it six summer. And it's like, man, if we wouldn't known Joey wasn't going, he could have finished the car to then have it down here. But won't be the case. So he's just along cruising for the week. So that's part of the fun. You know that. Uh, so where do you see Dragon Drive in five years? Dragon S Drive in five years. Still here. Bigger. Ideally. You know, yeah, like, as long as we can keep the EPA out of our butts. I think that's like, the only. I think that, I think you got that. I think that, I think the next big thing is like, I mean, you alluded to it earlier. It's like, I mean, there kind of needs to just be a rule set to say, hey, this is kind of the rule set. Like, and, and, and almost all the events have similar rules, but it's like really needs to just be that rule set that, hey, everybody just run these rules. Like, and you may, you may want to have motorcycles at your event. So, okay, have motorcycles at your event too. But like, maybe these 10 classes or whatever, try and just everybody agree on, hey, here's the rule set for these 10 classes. And yeah. like, everybody try and run these rules. There's no, you're not paying to run the rules or anything like that, but run the rules. That way, when people are building stuff, they're like, they know that it can go to any drag and drive and, um, and fit this rule. Like, not, well, it fits this rule at this race and this rule at this race and this rule at this race. I think that that's the, where there's only been a few choices, um, that's one thing. But now that there might be 20 choices, like, the rules are going to be a big thing that's going to preclude people. And sometimes it may ruin an event because they may come out with rules that are so different than some of the other events. They're like, well, yeah, I can't do that because whatever. I'd have to change too much of my car to run yeah. there. Like, yeah, because if somebody told you you had to have a certain turbo on your car, right? All, like, no, I'm not going to change it. That's too much work. Right. To where, like, in, I think that that's, that's the key to it thriving in five years. Is I mean, because you look at any of the big, any of the big racing programs or anything, and it's kind of like I mean, like radio racing. I mean, the, there's a common rule set that has developed over time to where there was certain differences in a lot of races. But they've almost all d came to the same thing because they were losing racers because they're like, well, this guy runs here and this guy runs here. But the rules are so different that they can't yeah. run at the other event. So it's like, OK, well, you got this guy and this guy's got this guy. Well, yeah. And radial racing, people like John Sears do a really good job at like keeping the pack tight. And yep. that gets really finicky and drag and drive stuff, because if you have to try to keep the pack tight. You suddenly will start to lose car count. But there are so many people knocking on the door trying to get in that it almost doesn't matter anymore because you will get the car count for some of the bigger events. Oh, and with Dragon Drive, too, I don't, I don't, know, of, I don't know of anybody saying, well, I can't be competitive, so I'm not going to go to... Rocky Mountain, or mm -hmm. I can't be competitive, so I'm not going to go to Sick Week. Like, I don't know of anybody doing that. Everybody just wants to be part of it and wants to go have the fun to where when you do get into that sanctioned radio racing stuff, then 
No, I mean, you, if there's 10 events a year and you know that you're a, a tenth off of everybody else there and you're not even going to qualify, like, yeah, I mean, that can get to the sour taste that, like, well, I'm just not going to go to that because my car doesn't fit that well yeah. enough or whatever. I'd have to make too many changes to take advantage of it to where, like, luckily, and hopefully it stays that way, is that Dragon Drive's not particular like that where they're like, oh, I can't be competitive. I mean, you can't go have a good time with your buddies, like cruising around the road no. for five days, then yeah, then maybe it isn't for you. But like, and like I said earlier, I mean, people get caught up in like how fast their car is. I'm like, then you're going about it the wrong way. Like go do a week when mm -hmm. let your car make it. And then you can worry about getting fast. Worry about being competitive in your class after you did it once. Like, because sometimes you won't even worry about that anymore. You'll just be like, eh, whoever runs, it runs. I don't care. Like, but I'm here to party every day and have a good time and follow along with everyone. Yeah, especially so. if you just hang around everyone. It doesn't even matter how fast your car is at that point. <clears throat> Honestly, the most fun you'll have is if you can hopefully make one pass and pack up and go back. Because if you make one bad pass, you're sitting in those lanes again. That's when the stress really starts to hit. You're like, oh, man, we was losing sunlight here. Or exactly. It's to... dark. I still got 300 miles to drive today. Like, Yeah, hopefully I can make something happen on this second one. Like, That's where it really starts to get tough. Once you're like two, three passes into the night, everybody's leaving, and you're like, oh, I, haven't made a pass. I haven't made a good pass yet. Yep. <laughs> so five years, still hopefully going strong. Um, do you... Oh, let's talk about the magazine a little bit. So... Pretty awesome. I feel like no new magazines have really come out in the last few years. And you kind of came out with like a book of the week, which is such a cool thing. And we can talk about your goals and thoughts behind Sick the Mag and who you want to highlight and how you how you go about highlighting these people. Yeah, I think that like, uh, I mean, with Sick the Mag, it was weird because that was like, that literally was like, me starting to do some YouTube stuff. So then Luke helping me with the YouTube stuff. And we were actually, we left Finnegan's shop and we were driving, we were driving to Taylor's. So like on a road trip or whatever and uh, um, doing some film stuff or whatever for the, the YouTube. And, uh, and we were just talking about magazines and like, and it was like, and that was at the point when um, like Motor Trend or whoever's the big owner of them just cut like 20 magazines or something. Yeah. And that's like, and we were just talking about people don't get it. Like the magazine companies don't get it. Like, I mean, you got to do something that is not bought and paid for by the advertisers. Nothing against sponsors and stuff like that because we mm -hmm. all need them. But like, but literally, like, if XYZ company wants to highlight a product, well, now it's like they actually write a whole article that makes you think that like that Hot Rod went and decided to do this article on this no it was bought and paid for by the company mm -hmm. like that very very few articles are just the article because that seemed like the right thing to write about it always had some purpose to it and it's like if somebody just really spent the time and highlighted the everyday person it's like because that's my part was that okay i get magazine coverage because i've been doing it so long in my cars um and my cars are always near the top and so I can get coverage, but people that were me 10 years ago, like there is no coverage for that because magazines aren't covering that stuff and still getting your car in print is way better than the internet. No matter, no matter what anybody said, it's still like, it's that Holy grail that like it made it into yeah. print. And, um, and it's, and it was like, well, if somebody does it right, then I feel like there could be like a nice following that would be like a core group and whatever. And like I said, Luke and I talked about it and, and Luke was the editor of a magazine in Australia. And so it's like, I'm like, so you could write this? Like if we came up with this concept or whatever, hypothetically or whatever, then you could do it or whatever. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, mate. Like and it's whatever. You know how Luke is. Yep. And, uh, um, and I'm like, well, I'll make a couple phone calls or whatever when I get back. So it's like, so, um, so I called Doug Emotion. I said, hey, will you give me some money to help start this magazine? And like, it'll be cool. I'm going to tell you, I'll tell you it'll be cool, but I don't know if it'll be good or not good, but we're going to give it, a, I want to give it a try. And he's like, oh yeah, whatever you want to do. And then like, um, Rick at Gear Vendors, the other one, and then Nolan at Isky, and then Steve. And, uh, um, and they're all like, yep, yeah, that's fine. I'm like, Luke, all right, Luke, I got it. Like, so, and I got it to where we're not going to have to go in the hole too much to make this, but let's do it. And maybe it end up be a one issue deal and who knows it, it might fail. Well, 
the market insane. Like that everybody's like, even before it ever went to print, people are like, this is awesome. Like whatever, conceptually, people are like subscribing to it. And, and that's the thing is we're a, we're a subscriber based magazine. So literally a subscription costs you 33 bucks a quarter. You get one double issue a quarter, but it is bought and paid for by the subscriber, not advertisers. So there's only, there's like eight ads in the whole magazine. And every time that there's an ad, it's only a full page ad. And we add another page to the magazine for that so that you're always getting 200 pages of content that is about whatever. None of that is bought and paid for by any advertiser or anything like that. It's in, and it's highlighting the everyday guys, not the, not the Tom Bailey's or the Cletus's or the Cooper's people like that. It's literally going to the Joe blow that like, Hey, he's got this $500 junker. Like, yeah, that's cool because you know what? People like reading about that because they can build a $500 junker. The attainable so, setup right. and the normal guy. And that's, what's really cool about it. And I, I also find that it's like a, almost like a hardcover book is really nice because it's not just like some road and track magazine that after uh, one read you're just like toss it yep. type of thing like, no and that's the thing it's like i i was the same like literally like i used to treasure my hot rod magazines well then now it's like you get a hot rod i flip through see if there's anybody i know if not i throw it in the garbage like mm -hmm. i'd never even think twice about keeping it for any long term but like when I was a kid, we always kept the magazines. Well, there wasn't the internet, so we always kept the magazines yeah. to learn how to do stuff from the magazine. But that's the that's the thing that we wanted to make sure is like high quality paper, like more like a coffee table style book, like something you want to keep, not throw away when you're done with it. And uh, and the other was actually came from Joe Barry, but he's like when talking about it, he's like, well, it better be packaged right because I cannot stand like I'll buy some higher end magazines. And literally they come to me with the label stuck on the cover and it just went through the mail and like oh, it's yeah. all damaged and it doesn't look good. Or it's in this cheap plastic sleeve that like gets torn or cut by the mailbox or whatever. He's like, I'm I'm buying something nice. Like I want to get it delivered to me nice. And that's where the bubble mailers and stuff came in. The fact is mm -hmm. like we're going to bubble wrap it or whatever for you, Joe. And like and then that became its own cult hit that like, well, I got the gold one or I got the... <laughs> purple one like well that's something i was talking about recently where we've gone so far into the everything's on video and now even in racing there's a 24-hour news cycle like on tv that getting something of like oh this happened a few months ago and like now it's like in fine print and actually highlights is kind of nice because you're so flooded with other information now it's kind of nice to revert back in a way I was just talking to Sam about how he should write a book. And I was like, it's nice to revert back to the to the style that everybody was like, oh, this is replacing that. But now it's 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 nice to have that. Yeah. And that's the the hard part, too, because like in that in that 24 hour cycle, it's like so like the magazine stuff, it's like anything that's in the magazine, not on the Internet. Like we don't put it out there or anything. Maybe after it's in the mm -hmm. magazine, it'll go out there. But like that's not. That's not how the world works now. They put everything like if you got, if you got this, Cooper got a new turbo. Like that's got to be on the internet. I can't tell you that three months later. I got to somehow tell you that yeah. right now, right this minute. And so, and Luke does a good job that all that stuff is just kept under wraps. And when the issue comes out, then like the idea is to be surprised by stuff that's in there that you didn't know. Like rather than oh, I knew that was coming. They already wrote that up. That was on in the internet story or whatever. Like three months ago so it's old news like yeah because even the website now has a lot of articles on it and i've been seeing um uh putnam posting yeah, derek, all of them yep. derek yep and those are pretty cool to see writing up all about the you know dragon drivers and those guys love that too because they may not even have ever gotten an article written about their cars now yep and suddenly you have somebody that has like inside knowledge on all these cars writing about them and it's just it's just all really cool the whole sick Everything, I guess, is just a cool eco spear that you kind of have built everything around. And it's just like a fun, it's just a fun community to be a part of. No, appreciate it. I mean, that's been the thing is like to just not worry about the almighty dollar or whatever and everything and then do things just the right way. Like mm -hmm. put it on the good paper because that's the right way to do it and bubble wrap it because that's the right way to do it. Like, and the same as like the online articles that Derek's doing now, like, 
it's awesome he's getting the stuff out there and like and we're doing it without pop-ups like there's no ads in it or anything like that well there's ads for the magazine and our merchandise the idea is that like yeah hey we're gonna that's what's paying for that stuff to be done is like hey subscribers to the magazine are paying for the the news to be able to be on the website because there's no ads in there we're not giving you the pop like that's the part that part came from like literally anytime you try and read something on the internet like half the time you give up on it because it pop-ups and article like in ads yeah. and everything else you're like is the article done Except was what i was reading cookies. done like yeah <laughs> and it's like why can't we do it without that like mm -hmm. they literally just write it about that and um so we try and educate people that hey realize that that stuff's not in there don't try and not take for granted that like hey there's no ads popping up or there's none of that stuff we want to tell you like be aware that that's not happening because, hey, subscribe to the magazine because that's what helps pay for this or buy some merchandise because that's what helps pay that this doesn't have yeah. ads in it. So I guess to end this yeah. off, um, how, can, how can the influencers that come to these events help you? Like, I go to this event. I can't – me advertising isn't going to sell more tickets. Do Getting on the live feed, is that what's good? You know, more live feed viewers, more people – you know, reading the magazine, more road weekers, sick, sick ward. How, how, like, how can they help you? Because that's the tough part. Cause I look at it. I'm like, nobody can provide you value in the sense of selling more tickets to come on the drive, but they could provide value to where more eyes are, I guess, on the sponsors. No. And that's the, and to me, that's the part like that, that literally that, um, unlike so many things are like closed. They're like, they just want to have control over everything. And like, and make it to where, well, no, you can't record video or you can't go live on your channel or whatever at our event because we've got a live feed or whatever. Mm -hmm. To me, it's to me, it's completely the opposite, which I mean, I, I mean, learned that from Cletus watching him do stuff that like, I don't care who's there. I don't care what you post. I don't care what you videotape. Like, I don't care what any of that stuff is. Go do whatever you want because at the end of the day it helps support you it also helps support the event and i mean it gets more eyes on everything and yeah. and i think that that's the that's the part with it that like you being cooper and doing it and like you have your cooper following well that just helps that helps build the community or whatever with it and like and at the end like people do end up subscribing to the magazine like we don't have to push it to them and People do buy the merchandise, and but should the merchandise, the merchandise needs to be cool enough that they want to buy the merchandise. Like, I mean, and, and that's the part that, like, if there's, if there's, four hundred people there and they're all doing their thing, well, the idea that that I said was sick week with Luke, the other day, I'm like, I hope that at the end of the week that we have people that aren't at the event that say, literally, if I see anything else about sick week, then I'm just gonna puke. Like to me, that's a positive because yeah. like, because you know what? That person is also saying, I missed out. Like I need to go there next year. Mm -hmm. I got to make sure that I'm there. Like whether I'm attending is like, is watching at the track or I'm in the sick ward or whatever that is, but I need to be there because like everybody's there and like, that's all the internet's about. And, and, and it was crazy because it hit, I mean, obviously last year was our first event and like, and literally that's what everybody said is like, well, whatever like the are you do you always just do sick week in florida you know we just did it once right yeah. like it's only happened once it like, didn't feel like the so, first event but i was there and i was like this event feels like it's been going for 10 years like it felt so, like <clears throat> it felt like a event that you go to like it felt like a long-standing event by the way that you guys put it on that's so, how that's no how appreciate it and i've been to enough events to be like mm -hmm. okay well i mean if we're going to do it we got to make sure we do it like as big as possible like as cool as possible and and in in so many people like they do events or they do different stuff like for the money it generates and like and i'm a racer so like i wanted to do it for the racers like i wanted to be the premium experience like to be the mm -hmm. super bowl that like everything is the the best we can possibly make it and, and with anything like, um, like, you know, I mean, you do something to the next level and like, you will be rewarded for it. So, but don't go into it like saying, oh, I got to make this or like, oh, I can't spend $10 more because yeah. I only got $10. Like, I mean, no. And that's what we did last year. That's what we're doing this year is like, Hey, we just want to make it as cool as we can possibly make it. And, um, 
and inclusive of everybody and like make sure like I mean that's you got motion sponsoring live feed again this year like it's it's free to watch it like I mean that's that's the thing and like do do you go like um do you appear in the live feed it's like yeah but that's good but do your own live feed it doesn't doesn't matter yeah. like at the at the end of the day it's like it's it everybody's part of it so it's like how the the more people that see it for you and they see it for me and they see it for like everybody else they it all ends up in the same spot yeah that makes sense um yeah so i guess we could just end it off there man that was an awesome conversation i'm super stoked for sick week coming up um where can they find you at so sickthemag.com sickthemag.com they can find you across all social media platforms live feed will be definitely one to watch this year there'll be a lot of a lot of uh records i imagine broken in drag and drive events but that's gonna do it guys thank you so much for coming on tom oh yeah no problem um maybe we'll do one after sick week again and we can see the tiredness in our faces <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> like, this is like a pre <laughs> it's like anything you gotta wait like you gotta wait a month after and then everything's great but for the first couple of weeks after, usually it's like, oh, I'm never doing that again. Like, yeah. that's horrible. Like, I wanted to do a podcast like this with somebody, like, the day before it starts and then have the same person on the day after it ends. Actually, no, like, what would be cool is daily, the same person. Can I get 15 minutes of you each yeah. day? Like, and, like, literally, like, you see them all, like, cheery, like, everything's great on Sunday. <laughs> all excited. Monday, it's still pretty good or whatever. Tuesday, like, oh, they're in the dumps. Exactly. And then you Wednesday, see, they're high again, like, it was a good day. Like, you see the person just change. Yeah. <laughs> well, that'll do it, guys. Thank you for watching. I'll Thanks, see you next time.